I'm glad you are here. Let's begin by praying. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Father, I thank you for the reminder from your word, even as we have just heard it, this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Father, I pray that you would get it deep within our hearts and our minds, that it wouldn't be just something that we can recite, something that we can know about, something that we can appreciate, but it's something that is a part of our lives. Father, I know as we've been learning together that this is not the kind of love we can conjure up on our own. We can't live this way on our own. Just like we cannot save ourselves, it's only by your grace and what you've done in our lives. So we can only live this way by your grace, by you living your life in and through us. I'm not capable of doing this. I'm not capable of living this way, but you are. And I ask you to continue to shape me and mold me into the kind of person who really does live out the greatest love as you have shown us and are teaching us through your word. And I thank you again for every single woman who is in this room, those who are live streaming, those who will listen later, every young woman, every girl, every teenager. I just ask for you to use this uh, in a way that only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last time we made it to the end of verse 5, and we even touched a little bit on the beginning of verse 6. But before we continue on, like I always like to do, is kind of review just a little bit. And I'm going to review, begin the review today in verse 4, rather than going through the first three verses, but I reviewed those last time. Love is patient, and we talked about how it means that it's long-suffering. It doesn't have a short fuse. It is a controlled strength. We talked about love is kind, and it's not just random acts of kindness that we can show every now and then, but it's purposeful. It's intentional kindness. It becomes a part of our character. It's not harsh or bitter. We talked about that. But neither is it sloppily sentimental as our culture seems to want to tell us it is. Kind Kindness knows how to hold the line, and it grows with time. Love is not jealous. We talked about two kinds of jealousy, two kinds of envy. Simple, the simple kind of jealousy, although any kind of jealousy is not simple, but in the fact that we want what other people have. We're jealous of what people, other people are, what they have, what they look like. But then it's more complex, too, where we don't necessarily want what other people have. We don't want those things, but we don't want them to have it either. And then we talked about how there will always be in this life a temptation to be jealous. And jealousy, we learn, left unchecked, and we looked at some examples in Scripture, but it ruins us because jealousy is a destroyer, and it destroys us rather than the people that we are jealous of. 
Love does not brag. And we talked about how it doesn't show off. It doesn't vaunt itself. It vaunteth, it vaunteth itself not. <laughs> and it doesn't parade its accomplishments. And of course, I should probably mention a caveat here. I can't remember if I did last time or not. Because of course, there's nothing wrong with having a healthy pride, which I hate to even say it like that, but a healthy sharing of life things with other people. Because I like seeing and hearing about what other people are doing. I like knowing that they can play the piano well, that they can sing, that they can do these things. I enjoy that. But there is a difference between showing off and breaking bragging to lift yourself up and to parade your accomplishments and platforming yourself and just sharing life events. Love is not arrogant. Right on the heels of bragging, we said how they're kind of like sister things, not arrogant. And of course, being arrogant, an arrogant person usually exaggerates one's own sense of importance. Arrogant people brag. <laughs> And they think they are better than others. They are condescending usually and patronizing. That's what arrogance is and that's what arrogance does. And we looked a little bit at Luke 18 at the tax collector and the Pharisee. Love does not act unbecomingly. That was the next one. And I love the way the New American Standard says that. Does not act unbecomingly. Meaning, of course, that love has good manners. It's considerate. It's not rude. It builds up. It doesn't tear down. You know, Proverbs 14 verse 1 says the wise woman builds her home but the foolish tears it down with her own hands one way to build your home is to act becomingly in your own home in the privacy of your own home with your husband with your children because we're good at acting becomingly when we're with other people when we're with our friends when we're with those outside of our home but the real test is are we acting becomingly in our own home homes, having good manners in our own homes, being considerate in our own homes, not being rude in our own homes. Love does not seek its own, meaning it's not selfish. It doesn't always have to have its own way. And of course, we talked about how we're all selfish by nature because we're sinners by nature. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us desires and wants our own way. But love, God's love, when it, it, it in, um, comes inside of us, we, don't, we end up giving that up. We are not selfish. We talked about how, though, this sometimes this selfishness shows up in us as mothers where we want total control. It must be my way or the highway. And the way I want everything done just the way I want it done. Love is not provoked. And, of course, another way to say this is that love isn't touchy or cranky, or even pugnacious. You know, that's one of the things in Titus chapter 1 on the list of what elders are not, you know, one of the qualities that they're not to have, they're not to be pugnacious. And, you know, don't you like that word, pugnacious? It means that you're ready to fight. That's what it means. It's just like the slightest little thing will set you off. Are you pugnacious? <laughs> Love is not pugnacious. It's not ready to fight so easily. It knows how to fight for the right things, for righteousness, but it's not easily provoked, bothered at the slightest provocation or interruption to its own schedule. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered, meaning it doesn't keep a record of those things. And of course, I talked about last time how we're all wronged. In fact, that's what the scripture tells us, doesn't take into account a wrong suffered, acknowledging that we will suffer wrongs in this life, but it doesn't keep a record of those things, doesn't keep score. You know, I used to journal all the time. I still journal, but I used to do it almost like religiously. And sometimes, occasionally in my journals, I would write about wrongs I had suffered. <laughs> I won't share what those are. <laughs> but sometime along the way of keeping those journals and as a young woman, and as I grew in my faith, I was reading through an old journal and I was reminded of a past wrong that I had recorded, that I thought I had gotten past. But as I was reading this journal entry, it was like I was angry all over again. And I remembered everything about the incident. But you know what I did in that moment? 
I just tore the page out of my journal and I tore it up into tiny little pieces and I threw it away. And, and, and as I stand before you today, I don't even remember what it was. I don't even remember who the person was. I don't remember anything about it and I'm grateful for that. That's only a work of God's grace. And this brings us to the next thing, verse 6, that we touched on just a little bit last time. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. The ESV says wrongdoing. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. And I asked you last time as we were closing out our session together, when you hear of someone's wrongdoing, what do you think? How do you feel? And if you're, and your answer, I said, would probably differ depending on the person guilty of the wrongdoing. The person guilty of the wrongdoing, is it someone you like or someone you don't like? And so think of someone that you dislike and you hear about here's a, her wrongdoing and the consequences they are facing because of that wrongdoing. What do you think? Do you think things like, well, getting what they deserved, I knew that was coming. Is there a little bit of satisfaction that rises up? But see, love refuses to take joy or satisfaction or pleasure from anyone's wrongdoing because a true believer loves Christ and a true believer does not rejoice in unrighteousness no matter who is doing it. And think about the Corinthians. We've talked about them as we've walked through this together. Remember, these are the people to whom Paul was writing. And they were a church where people in the church were engaging in all kinds of immorality. And if you don't believe me, just read the book. It's just kind of disgusting. All the things that they were doing and all the things that Paul was having to tell them not to do. And not only were they engaging in all kinds of immorality, but some of them were even bragging about it. And the church was doing nothing about it. They were just tolerating it. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you. He's talking, I mean, this is written to the church, the church full of believers. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, meaning those who don't know Christ, the unbelievers that someone has his father's wife, you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. Do you hear what he's telling these believers? This is what's going on in your church. You're arrogant over it. And you haven't mourned, and that's what you should be doing. That's what he says you should have been mourning instead. And you're doing nothing about this gross sin in your church. And then verse 3 continues, For I on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed, so committed this, as though I were present, in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you were assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, do you hear what he's saying? He's disciplining this person. He's saying this person needs to be disciplined. Is it just so he can get what he deserves? No, he says, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He cares about this man's soul. And then he continues in verse 6, your boasting is not good. I mean, they're bragging. Do you see why he's saying in 1 Corinthians 13, love doesn't brag, but they're bragging. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the or immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or with idolaters. And then, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. 
if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. This is a stern rebuke to these believers. He's telling them, you're tolerating immorality among brothers, among believers, among the sisters. You're tolerating this among believers. He says, you're not even to associate with someone who's living this way. That's how serious. And of course, his whole reason for talking about this discipline, again, is so that this person will be brought back to repentance. Now, you just think about that and think about this in light of the church today. Think about how much immorality today is tolerated by believers. And I'm talking about believers who are believers. People who are, you know, I mean, unmarried couples living together, but they're in good standing in a local assembly. Nobody wants to say anything to them because that wouldn't be showing love to call them out on their sin. Actually, just the opposite is true. You're not showing love not to call them out on their sin. Same-sex relationships condoned, or maybe even sometimes not condoned, but certainly not called out. Y'all, we don't want to offend anybody. And we say, that's not loving to call someone out for their sexual sins. That's what we say. We don't want to touch that. We just want to love them. But see, that only shows how much we do not understand about God's love. It shows us that we've adopted the world's definition of love. We just accept everything because that's what love is. The world says that love means accepting, 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 accepting. And in the day that we're living in, if you say anything, anything, you are a hate monger. I guess John the Baptist was a hate monger. I mean, he was calling out sexual sin, and he got beheaded for it. But Jesus said there was no one greater than John the Baptist. But this is also the church, this Corinthian church, where members were gluttonous. They were getting drunk at the Lord's table. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in, in verse 17. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. You know, we always, don't we want to be like encouraged, you know, when the pastor's preaching or one of our elders is preaching or when someone's giving us the word of God? We want them to praise us. But Paul says here, in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. Verse 19, for there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. You see the selfishness? Why he's telling them in chapter 13, love is not selfish. It doesn't seek its own. He's saying here, each one takes his own supper first and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? I mean, this is pretty harsh teaching. Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? I mean, you hear what he's saying to them? He's saying, do you despise God's people? Do you despise the church? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So he's reminding them of what the Lord's table is all about. 
And then verse 27, he continues, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and he's just been telling them that's what they've been doing, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must first examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Sleep, But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. There it is again. This is why he disciplines us. This is why God wants us to be so aware of our sin. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. The Lord's table's not about, it's not a, it's not a potluck supper. Let him eat at home so that, when, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. So there's more that he wants to talk to them about. And of course, we see from this passage that the Corinthians were being selfish. They were being gluttonous. They weren't taking the Lord's table serious, seriously. They were getting drunk. And God disciplined them for it. We, sick, some of you have even died. The true believer has the heart of Christ. The true believer understands God love, God's love and is grieved when believers stray and are disobedient. This is a, a, the apostle Paul. He's very stern in he, as he's writing them, but he's grieving over their sin. And of course, true believers, we, if, if you belong to Christ, you're grieved over your own sin. You don't brag about it. I mean, have you ever heard testimonies of believers where they almost seem to think that their past sins were cool? You know, and then I did this, and then I did this, but God saved me. Y'all, this is tragic. I mean, a true believer is ashamed of past sins. And he or she certainly doesn't find satisfaction in other people's sins or even satisfaction in sharing past sins. And even doesn't even share past sins unless in some way the Lord wants some part of that to bring glory to the Lord to help someone along the way. But so much of sharing of sins in this day and age where everybody says, oh, we just got to be transparent. Oh, I just need to like air all my dirty laundry. Oh, I just got to tell everyone every single bad thought I have. Y'all, that is not of the Lord. I mean, we ought to be using discretion with those kinds of things. Every one of us in this room knows that we've, every single one of us has thought a wicked thought. Every single one of us in this room, I don't care what your age is, has, has thought wicked things. Do you really need to share all that? We can just say we've all thought bad things. Because that's, we're sinners by nature. And we're ashamed of those things. And the question becomes, do you love Christ? Do you love him? Are you grateful for what he's done in your life? And there are no limits to his love. Now, 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, just let that sink in for a second. Keep fervent in your love for one another, believers, because love covers a multitude of sins. And then let me read it in its context. That was verse 8. Verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And then in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, the scripture says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins sins. And this same phrase is used again in James. You know, I was one time helping someone understand the principle of love covers a multitude of sins. And this is what I wrote to this person. Biblically, sin only needs to be exposed as wide as those who are hurt by it. 
When someone is in the middle of their sin, we guard what we say. We protect the one who is sinning and those he or she is sinning against. Why do we do this? Because we are hoping and praying for repentance. We are praying for restoration. Matthew 18 says this, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And then I continued as I wrote, in your case, your friend went to the one or two others and the sinning one repented. Perhaps your friend waited too long to go to the one or two others, but regardless, it happened, the confrontation and the repentance. 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, above all, keep loving one another earnestly from the heart since love covers a multitude of sins. Where repentance and love are, Sin is covered, not overlooked or excused or swept under the rug, but in forgiveness. And then I wrote James 5, verses 19 to 20 says this, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You see it again? That the believer's heart is always for repentance. The believer's heart is always for bringing someone back. It's just, it's not just to like talk about all the wicked things someone has done, or do you hear what so-and-so did? And then I continued in my email, I admire your friend for bringing his friend back. As Christians, and because we love each other in the Lord, we protect each other. We cover each other when repentance has taken place, and no one should talk about or spread how dirty the laundry was. God washes our sin away. He doesn't keep bringing it up, holding it against us once it has been cleansed and forgiven. Now, it is true that even with repentant sin, there can be and often are consequences to sins. Sometimes it shows up later. In this life, people we love will always disappoint us, and we will disappoint those same people. But we are to learn from both the right and wrong choices of both ourselves and others and choose to love and forgive those closest to us regardless of how they disappoint us or sin against us. We are to love and forgive the same way we want to be loved and forgiven. We want to cover the sins of others the way we would want them to cover and protect us. If we don't, we are proving that we really don't love Christ. Now let's move to the positive part of the verse, and that's love rejoices with the truth. See, as believers, we are so glad when truth prevails. Love cannot rejoice over untruth, over unrighteousness, over lies. (laughs) When the culture around us tells us to accept, embrace, celebrate even sinful lifestyles, A true believer cannot rejoice in this. And you know, you can tell a lot about so-called believers out there by what they rejoice over, what they're accepting, what they're embracing, what they're apologizing over, what they're saying about even things they said in the past. And now they're, they're like tripping over themselves trying to issue an apology to the world because they don't want to be seen as mean spirited. But the culture is going to tell us The culture is going to tell us to accept and embrace untruth. But uh, we can't rejoice in this because it's a lie. God's love and God's truth, loving, you know, God's loving people, but telling them the truth, they're they're intertwined. They're they're together. (laughs) And there's no rejoicing over the nonsense in the world today. This explains why true believers are grieved and they're saddened and they're heartbroken when abortion prevails and is triumphed in our land. That's why true believers are devastated when they see the direction the nation is going and and even with our leadership. 
That's why true believers are heartbroken when homosexuality is celebrated and accepted, when trans transgenderism is accepted and celebrated, when adultery is accepted and celebrated, when divorce is treated very flippantly, when immoral movies and television programs and all the propaganda of the world, even showing up in children's books and literature and their programs. That's why a true believer is heartbroken over these things because we rejoice in the truth, not in the lies. <laughs> and we're in perilous times, y'all. We are. We don't have anything to be afraid of. We should only be afraid if we don't walk in the truth. We're in upside down times and it seems to be on fast speed. It's like on fast forward. And yeah, you know, I'm sad even when I see on social media believers, people that I've respected and looked up to, Christian brothers even, celebrating immoral movies and television programs that they just can't wait to see the next episode. That hurts my heart. Love rejoices in the truth. It cannot rejoice in unrighteousness. It just can't. And think about it. What's the slogan that you hear and see everywhere? Love is love. No, no, no. God is love. Or people saying, you can't tell me who to love. God can, and he does. Yet our culture doesn't care about God. <laughs> Slaps God in the face and says he doesn't know what love is. We think we know love. <laughs> like the people who built the Tower of Babel. They thought they knew more than God knew. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. I mean, come, let us define what love is. Let us define what is acceptable. Let us define what is right. Let us define what the truth is. Let us do all these things. But God would have none of it. And he scattered the people there. And he confused their language. And oh my, how we are scattered today. And we are so confused today. Love rejoices when truth is exalted. Doesn't your heart leap for joy when you hear a godly pastor proclaim the truth? And doesn't it leap for joy when they proclaim it with love? And you know they're telling the truth and it leaps for joy too because you know it takes bravery. It takes courage. And aren't you a little bit disappointed when you hear someone that you respected, whether it's a pastor or, or, or I don't know, start like falling down the hill and, and kind of uh, apologizing for everything and saying, well, well, doesn't that hurt your heart when that happens? Love rejoices when truth is exalted. Second John, verses four to six, the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love. Just, just listen to how many times the word truth is in here and the word love. Whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth which remains in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Doesn't that re remind you of Ephesians? Speak the truth in love. I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in truth. Just as we have received a commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love. Now listen, this is God's definition of love, not the world's. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you are to walk in it. We are to walk in God's truth. Not my truth. Not your truth. Y'all don't use those phrases. 
Not your truth, not his truth, not her truth, not they truth, or all the silly pronouns people are throwing around. No, it's God's truth. And God wants to walk in his truth. And the scripture tells us here and all over the Bible that how do we know that we love him? How do people know that we love him? By our obedience to him. By our obedience to his truth. Not the twisting that the world is giving to the scriptures. John 14, 21, if you know me, you know I share this verse all the time. The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will reveal myself to him, show myself to him. I will be with him. Verses 23 and 24, if anyone loves me, he will follow my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. The one who does not love me does not follow my words and the word which you hear is not mine but the father's who sent me. So every time you see some, maybe some woman teacher out there that you just thought was awesome and she starts accepting some of the things of the way of the world and starts going against the truth, God, wait, I thought this. I thought the Bible says this. You go with, look at your Bible and if she's contradicting the Bible, you know, she doesn't love him. She's not walking according to truth anymore. She's walking according to her own truth or what she wants the truth of God to be. That's how we know that we belong to Christ, that we walk according to his word and not the way, again, that people are twisting his word, but according to his word. And we are to walk in love in our relationships that truth and love go hand in hand. And whether it's our parents, whether it's our husbands, whether it's our brothers and sisters in our families, our actual siblings, or whether it's brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And if we do not walk in love and truth in those relationships, it's proof positive that we don't really love Christ. So love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but love does rejoice in the truth. You know, and please remember, as I've tried to say over and over as we've walked through this together, is that we can only do these things as we let Christ do them through us. Because it's so easy to just follow along with what the culture tells you. And if you don't keep your heart and mind in the word of God and you're not growing and you're not moving toward him, you will just adopt whatever the TV ads are, just whatever the latest program that you watched. And you're like, yeah, well, that makes sense. The only way you're going to be discerning enough to, to tell truth from error is to be in the word of God and obey it. That's how you do it. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid that you're going to be led astray if you will walk in obedience You know, that song that I've kind of chosen for our theme, you know, it's always playing when you're coming in, and it will play at the end when I'm finished teaching. And, of course, I don't know if any of y'all have picked this up, but Claudia, she's been, I mean, great. I mean, I wanted this. I hope all of you have this because isn't this beautiful to put on your refrigerator and you have it? And then I wanted this song, so you can pick this up too because it has all the words to this song. But, you know, some of the words in here says, What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, 
but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Rich with theology. We have to let Christ do this through us. He is our hope. No matter how dark the world is around us, we have to hold fast to the faithful word. So am I living these things? Are you living these things? Are you patient and kind? Do you envy? Do you boast? Are you arrogant? Are you rude? Do you insist on your own way? Are you irritable? And resentful? Are those your defaults? Do you keep a record of wrongs that are done against you? Do you rejoice in wrongdoing or find some kind of satisfaction in it? Or do you rejoice in the truth? Do you protect other people? Do you protect their reputations? Do you ask God to restore them and bring them back to Him? Do you guard other people? The next thing is love bears all things. Bears all things. Love knows no limit. Love bears a load. Love deflects the wrongs. It doesn't rehearse them. It bears all things. Remember, hatred is the thing that stirs up strife. So think about it. Are you the kind of woman or girl who causes drama? Are you the one who will bring up things that maybe even someone else hadn't even thought of and it starts causing defactions and divisions? Are you the one who does that, can't wait to tell someone else about something that's bothering you? Because usually the drama queen that's creating negative drama has some hate in her heart. She's got some stuff in there and she wants to get others on her team. She wants them to hate too. And once again, this protection and this bearing of all things, this covering, does not mean overlooking sin. It doesn't mean, as I shared in that email that I wrote a few years ago, sweeping sin under the rug or or even pretending that it doesn't exist because you're covering it. No, because the other part of love is that it warns, it rebukes. We've already seen that with the Apostle Paul and the way he's like rebuking the Corinthian believers. It warns, it rebukes, it confronts, it puts itself out there to protect, even sometimes risking a relationship for the good of that person. I mean, think of a parent, for example, who sees his or her child going in a wrong way or living in sin or maybe even abandoning the faith. And that parent says, I'm willing to risk the relationship to see you redeemed. I'm willing to be slandered and misunderstood by you to see you brought back. I mean, it's the mark of a friend who sticks closer than a brother, receiving all kinds of abuse towards the one that this person loves with all their heart. And of course, that kind of parent waits for redemption. And when that redemption comes, the sin of the child is not brought up. The sin of the child is not rehearsed, remembered, thrown in the child's face forever. And if, because if that happens, it's not really love. It's maybe the parent was just embarrassed by what was going on with the child rather than wanting to see the wanderer brought back. Remember, love keeps no records of wrongs. If someone keeps a record of my wrongs that I've done against them and maybe comes and wants to just go over every single thing, then I know that person 
doesn't really love me, even though they, maybe they say they do. And the same is true of me. If I keep a record of someone else's wrongs and I just relive them and rehearse them and say, and then, then they, they did this and then they, they did that, then I don't love that person. And neither of those people in those situations are loving Christ because you see, love covers a multitude of sins, not overlooking them because you have to deal with them honestly. But in fact, y'all think about it, this is exactly what's pictured in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned. You remember what happened? I mean, they sinned. You remember how they were trying to hide from God in the trees as if they could hide from God? But they're looking to cover themselves. So they're hiding in the trees, and then they make for themselves loincloths trying to cover their shame. But God is the one, Genesis 3 tells us, verse 21, God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve, and he clothed them. He covered them. And we know that's a picture of the lamb who was coming to take away the sin of the world, who provides the covering for our sin through his blood on the cross. And that's what's pictured with the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the covering for our sins. Jesus' blood... <laughs> Walk him, wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus covers my sin because he suffered and bled and died for me. He took the punishment that I deserved. And because I believed in him, because I'm saved by him, he doesn't bring up all of my past sins. Because as we learned before, he's removed them as far as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more. He does not keep a record of wrongs. God's love covers the multitude of my sin. He didn't overlook my sin. He made a covering for my sin, and his son died for my sin. So then it makes us ask some questions. How protective are you? How much do you bear in your love? How covering are you towards others? Do you love enough to put your reputation on the line for someone else? But that's exactly what Jesus did. He was so slandered and so abused, but he loved us and his love bore all things, even to death on a cross. He did not seek his own. And then the next thing is love believes all things. <laughs> love has a trusting heart. <laughs> love is always eager to believe the better things, the best things. It wants to believe the best in a person rather than believing the worst. And of course, believing the best doesn't necessarily mean that you are gullible or that you are naive. We don't need to be gullible and naive. God wants us to be discerning. But real love doesn't believe the first word of gossip. Real love waits for further explanation. Real love is not a cynic. Proverbs 18, 17 says, the first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. Now, in our world of sarcasm and cynicism and being suspect of someone's motives or their heart, some of us just have this natural default to believe the worst about a person. Just to believe someone's trying to rip us off. Just believe someone's trying to cheat us. Just to believe that we just want to be negative, we assume bad motives of almost everyone. But love doesn't do that. Real love doesn't do that. It believes the best. But if my default is to be suspicious or cynical, then I have to recognize that and say, Lord, that is my default. That's what I naturally do. I don't want to be that way. Yet not I, but you live in me. I, please change that in my life. Help me not to be suspicious and cynical. Help me to choose your way. Your way, God's way, is believing the best until otherwise proven wrong. And sometimes we are proven wrong. And that's hard when you've believed the best and then you realize, whoa, I was so wrong about that. And again, we need to be discerning and wise, not easily fooled, but we are not to be always out there with our little, you know, telescope, our binoculars, I guess these are binoculars, this is a telescope, looking for faults, looking for the bad. And so often we judge others based on 
what? Our motives. We know what our motive would be. And we know sometimes our motive is off base and wrong. And so then we sometimes project our evil motives onto someone else. But see, here's the thing. When we're walking by the Spirit and we're letting God's love permeate us, we believe all things. We bear all things. That kind of thing invades our hearts. God transforms us. And we, don't, we end up not always assuming that others are motivated by evil or even just less than admirable standards. Always believes the best. Love does. You know, remember Job, he had these friends and they believed the worst about him and told him all kinds of things. They just believed the worst about him. But what's your default? What's my default? I mean, if, you t- if you're the type of person who tends to demand perfection in your world, whether in your possessions, <laughs> they've gotta be the best, or of your people, they've gotta be the best. And you really struggle that you're not the best, but you want to be the best, or you don't, and you struggle with uh, those kinds of things, and maybe you struggle with the fact that your people aren't the best, then what happens if you struggle with those things? So often what will happen is you'll end up judging and criticizing and believing the worst. Sometimes you end up calling people names. Oh, they're just lazy. Or, you know, they're just this, they're just that. You're passing judgment on them because they don't measure up to your standard because your standard is perfection. Because so often if, if those around us don't live up to our standards, then they are less than. They're not as good. And we're sarcastic. And we're cynical. And we believe the worst about them. So again, love is patient, verse 4. Love is kind and love is not jealous, does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, then love hopes all things. It always hopes. Love has a hopeful heart. In Proverbs 31, when God is describing the excellent woman, he says this, Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. The NIV says it like this, she can laugh at the days to come. The King James says it like this, and she shall rejoice in the time to come. This woman knows the reality of life. She knows that she's aging. She knows that her days on earth are limited. Yet why does she smile? Because, you know, the day and age in which we live, aging is seen as a really awful thing. And I suppose it is, because if there's no hope in God, if you have no hope, then when you die, that's the end. So this is all you have. You know, this is it. So therefore, you're not going to smile at the future. You're going to frown at the future because, because there's nothing else. But this woman smiles at the future. Even though she's aging, she knows she's going to die. She knows that her days on earth are limited, but she's smiling. Why is she smiling? One, because she's prepared. She's prepared her family. We see that in the whole chapter. We see that in the whole book of Proverbs. But the bigger part is that she knows God. She knows her end. She knows with every single day, she is closer to seeing her Savior face to face. We'll be talking about that a lot next week. The only way she wouldn't be smiling or hoping all things is if her focus is on herself and all the trinkets of this world, like Lot's wife. But God's woman is hopeful, and she hopes all things. She's smiling even in perilous times, even when it seems all hope is lost, even when it seems the world is just so dark. She hopes all things, and it's not some optimism that she has. She's in reality. It's a realism, but she remains hopeful even in the mess-ups of life, even when people around her flounder or wander away or seem to have lost their way. 
They know, even those people know by your love for them that you haven't given up on them because you hope all things. You haven't written them off. I mean, think about this again. I mentioned a second ago about children. Think about that. You recognize faults in your child, but you don't see them as like the worst of the worst. You don't see their foibles as their whole life. And you certainly never use terms like the black sheep of the family. No, as a mom, you hang on, you hope, you pray, you anticipate, and you don't ever, 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 ever give up on your children. Not ever. Even when it seems all hope is lost. And I know there are a lot of women listening to me right now who it seems all hope is lost when it comes to their children. I know because I talk to them. Don't give up. And this is like God. He doesn't give up on us. He's always waiting for the penitent child to receive. You know that hymn? Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Just listen to these words. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. We bore the erring one. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Though they are slighting him. You know people who are slighting the Lord? Still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, cords that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. This is the heart of our Lord. That's what he tells us in Second Peter chapter 3, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This kind of love, hoping all things, doesn't keep harping on the past. It looks forward to what will be, what can be. That's what it means to hope all things. And y'all, we're out of time. We're going to pick it up right here next week for our final time in the greatest love. I hope you'll be here. I hope you'll come. I hope you'll watch if you can't. There's so much more to say about love hoping all things. I'm kind of stopping in the middle of it, but I know I can't continue. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for the truth of your word. I thank you just for the reminder that love bears all things, that love hopes all things. Father, help us to be the kind of women who don't ever give up on people, that until their dying breath or till our dying breath, we, we just need to keep praying and keep hoping against hope that the penitent heart will turn to you. Father, I think of so many people that I've known over the course of my life who now seem to have wandered away from the faith, people who grew up in this church. And I, I think of friends I have, and I think of women who write me And Father, I just pray for each and every one of them that they would not give up on the people that they love, that they would hope against hope, they would keep praying. Father, I pray too that we would be the kind of women who know how to smile at the future, smile at the future because we know that with every passing day we are closer to seeing you face to face. But until you call us home or you return, you have called us to speak your truth to a lost and dying world. You have called us to share the gospel. You have called us to teach the truth, to live the truth. You have called us to obey what we know. We don't know everything, but we know some things. Father, help us to be women of the word. Father, help too. I've encouraged our women to memorize 1 Corinthians 13. I pray that you would help us do that. And again, not just so we can recite it, not just so we can say, hey, I learned it, 
but that it would be part of our very being, that you would remind us of its rich truths as on those times when we're tempted to have a short fuse, when we're tempted to be jealous, when we're tempted to not be hopeful. I pray that you would remind us of the truth of your word and that it is, is not us, but it's you who live through us. Thank you so much in Jesus' name, amen. All right, time for a door prize.